Welcome to our McMaster alumni presentation on, um, on fraud awareness brought to us by our partners at TD Insurance. And I'm so pleased to have Nick Sarusha joining us today. Um, Nick is a branch manager at TD and uh, leads a team of financial advisors and customer service representatives at his, uh, at his branch. And he's gonna impart on us some knowledge of how we can be smarter around fraud awareness. March is Fraud Prevention Month, uh, month, which is an annual campaign that seeks to help um, all of us recognize, reject, and report fraud. And um, we, I googled it um, this morning and, and found that this year's theme is 20 years of fighting fraud from then to now. That will help us to understand how fraud has evolved over the years. And if I can think back, you know, it, it wasn't so long ago that it was just telemarketing scams, but now it's it's email scams, social media, and AI. And I'm sure Nick's going to touch on that during his presentation. I'm Karen McQuaig. I'm the alumni director at McMaster, and I'm so pleased that you're able to join us on um, the first full day of spring, which doesn't feel so much like spring here in Hamilton and Burlington, but I'm hopefully wherever you're tuning into, it's a little bit warmer. Uh, Nick's going to lead us through a presentation. We do have some video, so you might hear every once in a while or see the screen change and another person come on to play the video. But we've got a great presentation. We got lots of questions before the webinar, so we're going to try to make sure we answer all of those questions. But feel free at any time, if you have questions during the presentation, to pop them into the Q&A, which is at the bottom, and uh, we'll be able to do our best to, to answer all of your questions. And I think that's all I have to do to get us started on this afternoon's presentation. So Nick, over to you. Thanks, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well and clear. Um, I understand it's um, Wednesday, mid of the week, busy day. Thank you for taking the time to join me in this presentation. And of course, thank you, McMaster, for uh, doing this, creating the awareness about fraud during the right month, fraud is I mean, March is Fraud Awareness Month. So we are doing the right thing on the right time. Um, the objective of uh, this uh, webinar is basically to educate you on identifying some red flags, some fraud techniques, um, action on how to action potential fraud. We'll share some tools and resources um, to let you know how you can fight if you find that you have been a victim of fraud. Um, let's go right in. So basically it's uh, simple and easy. I'll try to keep it easy for everybody to understand without making it much uh, complicated. Um, what we are going to do today is to know what fraud is, where everybody, everybody knows what fraud is, but basically try to understand what fraud in financial term means um, to give you a better idea. Um, we will share on what TD Bank or for that matter, any bank will never ask you to do. We'll share some common um, scam scenarios, which is romance scams, investment scam, uh, grandparent and emergency scams, so on, or also share some tools and resources. And then we'll go through some questions, some Q and A's. Uh, let's go ahead. So what is fraud? In a simple language, if we say fraud have multiple um, meanings, but fraud is basically defined as um, the crime of using dishonest methods to take something valuable from another person. If that makes sense, right? It's simple and easy to understand. Financial fraud is a problem that affects um, millions of Canadians, of course, uh, everybody, but when you're talking about Canadians, millions of Canadians every year, with older Canadians uh, increasingly becoming target of potential fraudsters. Every day, day in and day out, um, we at branches see customers, especially seniors, becoming victims of fraud. Despite of having the educations, these fraudsters and scammers are smart. They know how to make these people come into their words and do things that they ask to. Identifying fraud is difficult because there can be many apparently legitimate elements in each fraud attempt. With this session, uh, we intend to educate and bring awareness about ways that you can protect yourself from becoming a victim of fraud. The main intent behind any fraud technique is to obtain your money, simple, okay? Um, some of the common um, fraud techniques, phishing. Phishing basically is the attempt to obtain confidential information from you by a way of a fraudulent email. 
Phishing is one of the most common tactic that leads to fraud. Often the email will ask you to log into a secure website and enter your password and other confidential information. Fraudulent emails, SMS, text, and phone calls all share the same intention to steal your personal, personal information. There are multiple ways a fraudster can reach out to you with requests for fraud, uh, personal and financial information. If you receive a request that doesn't seem right, it might be fraud. The only thing I can share with phishing is do not click anything that is sent by a bank, supposedly a bank, because a bank or a financial institution will never ever send you anything that con contains a link, that has a link. And um, I, cannot, I cannot tell you like how many times we have come across instances where people who are, who are tax savvy, who are working in industry, which is technically with technology and safety and security of um, financial resources and systems are also victim of fraud. So there is no free money in a simple language. If anything that you receive from any bank, whether it's a link in a uh, SMS or, or an email, that's not legit for sure. Um, how do you spot um, social engineering techniques? Right. So basically, um, social engineering is the act of exploiting human weaknesses to gain access to personal information. Connected systems. It relies on manipulating individuals rather than hacking computer systems to gain access to their victims account. Now, we do have questions from customers at time that how can I protect myself from um, avoiding from having a, being a victim of fraud? Can I install systems? Can I install malware? Can I install whatever? The problem is whatever you do, if you do not have enough safeguard in place for yourself by being proactive and using your judgment, the systems will not help you. Honestly, you can have everything, but if you are not cognizant, you will not be able to protect yourself. Social engineering technique lures, um, lures us into clicking on malicious links and attachments or into providing sensitive information that can be used to launch crimes, cyber crimes, or commit financial frauds. Uh, not necessarily you will see customers who have money, they lose money, but they might be manipulated in a way that they commit a crime indirectly without them knowing that they are doing, committing a crime. Understanding how to spot social engineering techniques can help save you from becoming a victim of financial fraud. Sending threatening emails, intimidating emails, phone calls, texts, uh, text messages are techniques um, social engineers will use to scare you into acting on their demands for personal information or money. I can give you some examples. We had um, recently um, a customer comes into a branch. Customer is on phone, um, is being asked by the fraudsters to do certain things. While they are in the bank, they are still not comfortable letting the bank officials know that I'm being a victim of fraud because they were being told by the fraudsters that if you share anything with the bank officials, you'll be in more trouble because the bank is involved in a fraud. This is what the fraudsters say. Simplest thing is if you feel that there is something wrong going on with your financials or your bank accounts, and you feel that there is a bank officer, a bank employee involved, get help by reaching out to the bank customer care, reaching out to a manager, because that's not going to happen. There's no way a bank employee will be involved without being um, traced, without being tracked. So if you think there's still a possibility that somebody's doing it, escalate it. Talk to the right people. Don't keep it to yourself. Suspicious emails um, or texts that include urgent requests for personal information are major red flags that someone is trying to trick you. When a bank sends you a message, usually they'll send you, let's say, for example, you have set up a text message alert for uh, low balances. You might get messages from bank. Banks will never send you a message that will say that click a particular link or what's your card number or what's your PIN number or what's your date of birth, for example. There will be no information required by a bank if there is anything, again, I'm telling you, if there is any message that comes from a bank asking for information about yourself, it's not the bank, right? Uh, uh, when you see at times uh, social media people, for example, you will be getting messages from um, Facebook, from Instagram, 
from supposedly people dealing as a bank employees. Recently, there was a fraud in Quebec where um, a bank employee reached out via Facebook. I don't know the whole story, but it was it was it was strange. Like, how can you believe that a bank employee will be reaching out to you via Facebook or social media and asking you, uh, telling you that you are being a victim of fraud? I'm I'm, I'm investigating, right? Simple thing, but people still fall victim to these things. Um, okay, we'll play a video um, to let you just just go through the video and you'll get an idea. And I'll I'll request you to put some questions at the end in case if you have after the video. Yo, can you please put up a video? Beautiful Friday here in Times Square. Welcome back to GMA. So we want to get right to this uh, GMA cover story. It's got us talking. We are approaching what's called Dating Sunday. It's supposed to be one of the biggest dating days of the year. And then there's this. According to the reports of romance scams are on the rise, costing Americans nearly $1 billion last year alone. So Whit Johnson is here with what's being done to take down these scammers. And Whit, we were, had questions about this. It's supposed to be one of the very, George especially, very popular times to be on dating apps. Tell us more. Cecilia, that's right. Good morning to you. So look, the criminals know that too. Experts tell us that this time of year, from the holidays to Valentine's Day, is prime time for romance scammers to prey on their victims. The impact can be devastating. And we spoke with one woman who lost nearly $200,000, and she warns just how convincing these scammers can be. When Rose Martin met Diego Francisco on an online dating site, she thought she had found her match. He sent me a picture of him in a muscle t-shirt, and he was showing me this dessert he made, but I didn't pick up on anything out of the ordinary. Authorities say behind the facade of her Italian suitor were actually six suspects indicted in federal court in 2021, accused of running a three and a half million dollar romance scam. These people are predators and they're conducting emotional and financial warfare. It's a reboot of an age old scam, says the IRS, tricking new victims today. The story that they used often was the scammer was purporting to be on an oil rig. He sent me a video of him doing the job under the water. Then all of a sudden this was going wrong and that was going wrong and he would ask me to send money to get the machine fixed. Over the course of several months, Rose telling us she sent the man she thought was Diego more than $175,000. The scammers so convincing, Rose said they would send links to fake websites showing bank accounts flush with funds to reassure her that she would get her money back, even video chatting with her. That's what they're doing now, something as low tech as taking someone's video off of social media and just dubbing your own voice over it. Investigators telling ABC News the six suspects behind Diego are Nigerian. One defendant, Oluwatomiwa Akintola, pleading guilty this October, sentenced to over four years in federal prison. According to the <coughs> indictment, Akintola's shell company received over $700,000 from multiple victims, including money from Rose. In this case, the money went to luxury items for themselves. They put money back into their business to send out documents that appear legitimate, that are fake. Documents like the photo of this passport claiming to belong to Diego. ABC News used reverse imaging on the photos of Diego sent by the alleged scammers and learned that they are instead pictures of T.R. Pescott, who works as a model. The images matching those posted to Pescott's confirmed Instagram account. We arranged for Rose to meet TR virtually. It's so very nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. As you can tell, my voice is not the same, I guess, from the person to No, you. it's not. It's totally different. It's been crazy, I have to say, over the past four or five years. Almost every week, I receive up to a dozen messages more from women around the world saying that, I've scammed them, but then also showing me different profiles of other aliases using my photos. The U.S. Secret Service, who jointly investigated this case with the IRS, says they've recovered $100 million from such bad actors in 2022 alone. One of the tips is to do some of your own detective work. Bad actors are many times lazy and they will look anywhere they can for a photo. Many times you'll find that that image is posted in Instagram. Pinterest or some other uh, social media type service.
Now, in this specific case, three of the six defendants have already pleaded guilty. They've been sentenced from several months to several years in federal prison and ordered to pay restitution of up to $1 million. The remaining defendants have pleaded not guilty. Their cases are still pending. As for the victim, Rose, who we spoke with, she has not yet received any financial restitution, but tells us she's hopeful to get something back in the future, especially because that money she sent to the scammers was her entire life savings, guys. Oh, it's horrible. And yeah, we hope she can recover. With thank you so much. Well, scary, isn't it? So this segment of uh, Good Morning Good Morning America shows us the reality of romance scams and the impact they can have on individuals. I was attending um, a seminar, a fraud awareness seminar for bankers uh, back in 2022. And one of the managers from a bank shared how um, the, the, the fraudsters or the, the scammers manipulate uh, the customers, the victims. So uh, this customer was um, sending wires, multiple wires to somewhere in, in an African country. And the bank or the employees probably sending money, helping the customer said, you know what, you have been sending this money. Do you know this person that you're sending the money? This customer um, does not give answer, uh, starts to argue, says, this is my money. You don't have um, any right to ask all those things. The manager is involved. Manager goes and asks the questions. And the, the, the customer shows uh, messages, WhatsApp messages, where the customer was receiving messages from this supposedly friend of hers and saying that the family is in danger. Um, they need money. Her, uh, the, the, the fraudster's kid is in hospital, they need money, send the pictures of that. The manager explained to her, this is a scam, do not send money anymore. She went to another branch and sent money. So you can imagine how they manipulate the, 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 the seniors and how they target them, how we don't know. How do they know that this particular customer is a senior or the, or the victim is going to be a senior? We don't know. But the key takeaways from um, the video um, higher chances of romance scams between New Year and Valentine's Day. There is a rise in online dating uh, during this time, of course. Um, in 2022, romance scam, as we saw in the video, cost $1 billion to, the, to Americans in that particular year, in 2022, just one year. Victim was scammed 175000 by six bad actors claiming to be in relationship to her. So again, if you have any questions with this, please put your questions in the, in the chat box. We're more than happy to answer the questions. So coming back to um, what banks will never ask you to do. So TD Bank, for example, or any bank will never call you to ask for your personal information, will never ask you to be dishonest will never rush you into doing something or threaten to cancel your services if you don't do it. Now, <clears throat> the problem is, <clears throat> excuse me, identifying fraud is hard with technology evolving so quickly. Um, there are people using artificial intelligence to um, use voiceovers and stuff, right? It's becoming more challenging to identify fraud before it occurs. Being diligent and aware of existing emerging trends of frauds can help us reduce uh, in becoming a, a victim of fraud. Keep these tips in mind and share them as much as you can with your family, friends around you to help them stay protected as well. Although these points are specific to TD, like I said, but no bank usually will ask to share any of these details with you, okay? Um, let's go over some scam types, um, common scam types. Uh, education and awareness are two key steps you can take to protect yourself and your loved ones from becoming victim of financial fraud. We'll look at some common scam techniques that are on rise um, and that'll help you bring awareness about ongoing fraud trends. As we review these techniques, keep in mind that there are many types of scams. However, they all have the same intent to steal money from you. And like I said, multiple scams, but we'll just go through some common scam scenarios, which are most common and cost millions of dollars to people. Um, the first one is romance scam. Everybody knows about this. Romance scams are when fraudsters, like we saw in the other video, build a relationship with their, um, the victims over dating websites, social media, phones, texts, um, etc. 
In many of these cases, the fraudsters pretend to fall in love with their victims and exploit their trust. Romance scammers may spend weeks, months, or even years in a relationship with their victims. It never happens instantly. These people know how to manipulate people. They know how to play people's mind. They spend six months, and there are instances they spend two, three years before doing anything uh, financially with the customer or with, with the victim. They'll ask for money or personal information on an urgent or emergency basis before you can question the legitimacy of the request. You will never know that this person is scammer because you have been manipulated. You have been fooled by them for two, three years, gaining their trust. We'll go um, over a quick video here to know more about uh, romance scams. Ah, uh, romance. Ain't it grand? When love is in the air, everything seems a bit brighter. And often, people say goodbye to logic and judgment. You see, Cupid has some cousins, and these guys are not good guys. Some dating and romance scams work by setting up dating websites that make you pay for each email or message you send and receive. Scammers will then attempt to keep you writing back and paying money for the use of the website. Even on a legitimate dating site, you might fall in love with a person from a faraway country who happens to have a very convincing story about a sick family member. As romance blossoms, the idea of sending them money to help their situation just happens to pop up. Others ask you to help them get out of the country they're living in by sending a large amount of money. Between the virtual hugs and kisses, they'll ask for your banking details, and your bank account and your heart will be broken. When love is in the air, we're vulnerable. We want to believe the best about those we communicate with, online or even through letters. But over and over again, it's been proven that your romance will end up being all about your money getting into the hands of someone who is definitely not your type. Check website addresses carefully and make sure the sites are legitimate. Never send money or give financial information to anyone. Don't let Cupid's cousins break your heart. With love, from the Competition Bureau of Canada and the Little Black Book of Scams. Great. Okay. So if you saw some common points um, in the video here is some dating and romance scams work by setting up uh, dating websites that make you pay for the messages you send and receive. And even on a legitimate dating site, you may get into a long distance relationship with somebody claiming to be uh, in need of money and will seek help from the victim. Now, romance scams work by using emotions and vulnerability to get your bank information and personal details. Protect yourself by checking the legitimacy of websites. Never give out any confidential information or send money to anyone. Another instance that I would like to share um, from one of the um, one of my friend's um, experience, a customer who passed away while their family was helping them with the estate, well, what was going with the estate process, they figured out that the deceased lost 200,000 over a period of two years to scammers. The family even didn't knew that the father is being a victim of, victim of scam. So you can imagine how strongly they take the victims into their game by manipulating their minds that they won't even share with their close family members, right? Next up is the investment scam. Investment uh, scams can take in uh, many different forms. One of the scams involve fraudsters sending out phony offers to people by email, instant messaging platforms, social media, and even dating websites, telling them to invest while promising high returns quickly. The investments range from new companies, technologies, or digital currencies. Scammers will often promise low-risk investments with high returns, creating a strong, like extremely strong sense or urgency for you to invest pretty quickly. They often research their potential with teams online and build relationships based on common interest. Be aware of some, somebody asking you to join a business venture with them, which promises high return. We have all seen um, multiple instances during the um, wheat stock era or the cryptocurrencies. People have invested tons of money, made ton of money, but then you have many people, like most of them who lost a lot.
like they invested 10,000, they lost 90% of the money, right? Uh, let's go through a quick video on how investment scam works. Here they are, the three most dangerous words in the English language. Get, get rich, 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 rich. Oh wait, maybe it's these three. Double your money. Oop, forgot these ones. Limited time offer. These words are the most common signs that you may be in the presence of investment fraud. They're empty promises made by criminals preying on your desire to do well with your investments and look after yourself and your family. And by the way, investment fraud is just as dangerous whether you're in your 20s just starting out in a complex world of investing or you're a senior trying to ensure a comfortable retirement. Look, when it comes to investing, beware of guaranteed high returns with little to no risk, hot tips, high pressure sales tactics or impossible promises. Be careful of unsolicited investment opportunities. These can be offered over the phone, through social media, or by text messages from a stranger. Be diligent. Research the opportunity through credible sources. Take your time before saying yes, and be sure the person or organization approaching you is registered. The Competition Bureau and the Ontario Securities Commission are working hard so people like you don't become the victims of fraud. Oh, three more words. Do your homework. For more information, visit competitionbureau.gc.ca and checkbeforeyouinvest.ca. To report a fraud, contact antifraudcenter.ca. Great. Three simple words. Do your homework. I know it's not difficult to do that, but still people miss on doing that and lose thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, valuable money to the scammers. Investments claiming to get rich, double your money, and sign up for limited time offer are three key phases that may be a red flag for an investment scam. Be aware of guaranteed high returns with little to no risk. Be careful of unsolicited investment opportunities through phone, social media, or text messages. Protect yourself by taking your time before saying yes and do research to make sure the person reaching out to you is registered. Uh, next, most common is emergency grandparent scam. Grandparent scam, also known as emergency scams, rely on convincing you to act urgently in a time of need and often prey on um, emotions of the victim. The scam often starts with the victim receiving a phone call from someone impersonating a grandchild or a close family member. The fraudster goes on to say that they are in trouble, such as being arrested or in an accident and asks the victim to send the funds immediately, urgently. The fraudsters will often swear the victim to secrecy because they don't want to share the situation with others. However, this is done to prevent further scrutiny. They may use threatening or aggressive language to make the situation seem urgent. Fraudsters do not always impersonate family members. In some situations, the fraudsters may impersonate authority figures. We all know how many times um, we have heard about um, victims from CRA calling them and asking them to pay money. Police, OPP, RCMP calling those victims and saying them uh, to pay money or they'll be arrested. Let's take a quick look at uh, a short video on emergency scams and some common techniques and how you can protect yourself. Of all the scams in the little black book of scams, we're pretty sure that emergency scams wins the most despicable prize often targeting grandparents and playing on their emotions to rob them of money. Scammers phone the innocent senior claiming to be one of their grandchildren and saying, usually with a high level of emotion, that they are in some kind of serious trouble and need money immediately. Techniques include saying they've been in a car accident or are stuck in a foreign country. 
To make the scan even more disturbing and realistic, the grandparent often also receives a call from a fake police officer or lawyer. All of this is carefully orchestrated by the scammers, who are talented actors, and it's all designed to get you to make a decision based on emotion and not logic. Emergency scams are all about stealing money. And when emotions run high, people too often give out their banking information or actually go through the process of wiring money to the scammer. Always ask if the call makes sense. If the person on the phone really behaves like the relative you know and love. Take the time to call other relatives to verify the story before doing anything. Protect yourself and your loved ones from emergency scams. A message from the Competition Bureau of Canada and the Little Black Book of Scams. Okay, so the emergency scam often targets uh, grandparents and plays on their emotions to rob their money. Uh, multiple times you will come across situations where the close family members are not uh, informed about these things where supposedly a grandchild called. They do not discuss this with their close family members. If somebody's calling you, the first thing you will do is to connect to somebody who you can trust. But these people, the, the, the scammers, the fraudsters, they manipulate you in such a way that we have instances where the customers have given, the victims have given money to supposedly somebody presenting uh, to be a representative of police but they were amazon guys like not just amazon like career guys and you question yourself like how did a victim or this person give money to somebody pretending pretending to be a representative of police why would police send the money i mean send somebody to collect money from you who is a career or third party guy but these people they give the money because they are stressed because they talk to their close ones supposedly who are in trouble uh, scammers phone senior claiming to be uh, being one of their grandchildren uh, children in some kind of trouble and needing money urgently. The most common techniques that they use is they are stuck in a foreign country or in a car accident or sometimes uh, they are in a friend's car. The friend's car had drugs in them and they uh, are the, the friend is now caught arrested and since they were in the car, uh, they are also being arrested and then the police wants to talk to the grandparent. Emergency scams are all about stealing money and when emotions run high, people may give, um, give away money without thinking twice. They'll not talk to their family members. Protect yourself by really thinking about how the person is behaving and call other family members to verify the details. You can protect yourself simply by following some common simple techniques like reaching out to somebody you can trust. Some red flags, um, on scam, the most common red flags um, when you're dealing with scams. Asking for money or personal information on urgent or emergency basis. Asking to join a business venture with them which promises low risk returns. If you are being asked for personal information, personal financial information, stop and think about whether the request could be a potential scam. The first thing, even if somebody is legit, if they call you and ask for simple information, try and use the most common uh, thought process is is there a possibility of scam here? Knowing the common red flags of scam will help protect yourself from becoming a victim of fraud. Receiving two good to be true offers by email, instant messaging platforms or social media or dating sites are usually not true. Regardless of the type of the scam, they all have the same intention to obtain your personal or financial information. You'll, you probably heard this again and again during this uh, webinar that the only common goal is to obtain your personal or financial information. At times, uh, they'll be using threatening, aggressive language and swearing on you uh, to secrecy, which all leads to gaining the confidence. Protect yourself. How can we protect yourself? Let's go through some uh, tips and best practices that you can uphold to avoid being a victim of fraud. As a financial consumer, there are many ways you can protect yourself. The first one and the most common, the most simplest one, which if people start to use this, majority of the frauds can be avoided, is to talk to somebody you trust. If you are asked for any personal information or money or financial information, don't act impulsively. Don't act right away. Many scams rely on 
convincing you to act urgently in time of need and prey on emotions. A common trend we have seen that when they, the scammers um, usually try to scam uh, seniors, they usually call them in early morning hours. That's a common technique. The seniors are trying to get up for the day, get ready for the day. They are not prepared for anything. They are not prepared for any such emergency call or urgent call. And then suddenly they receive this call, make them frantic and make an impulsive decision. If something seems strange or too good to be true, reach out to a trusted family member or friend who has your best interest in mind and give you a second opinion, the right opinion. Be diligent with protecting your personal information and passwords from everyone. Everyone. There have been multiple cases where um, customers have been taken advantage of and frauded by family members and friends. Remember, your password your information, your secrecy is yours. We come across situations where um, husband brings in a wife's card and tries to use it on a joint account. Agreed. You cannot use it. It's a joint account. Absolutely. You cannot use it. You have to use your own card. Right? So be careful. Reach out to somebody you trust. Advice number two. Again, simple. Everybody knows this. Never share your PIN your password, password with anybody. You play a key role in protecting your security when using online services and part of your security responsibilities include ensuring you don't carelessly or improperly handle, store, or disclose your PIN and passwords. Again, your PIN and passwords, according to any bank's contract or binding is to be completely secret and should not be shared with anybody. Father cannot share with son, son cannot share with father, like nobody. Instead of writing your password down, if you have trouble remembering passwords, leverage smartphone's ability to use biometric IDs to log in, such as face ID or fingerprints. This leads to a common question when customers say, should I use STAP or should I use PIN? I don't like to use STAP because it's risky. Yes, it is. But it avoids you from inputting your PIN at multiple places for up to a certain transaction. You're buying something, let's say $20. If you have tap, you will be um, reducing the exposure that you would have of sharing your pin with somebody else or somebody looking at your pin. So if you are not comfortable um, having a tap on your phone, still okay, but make sure, uh, or your card, make sure that you are extremely diligent with keeping it confidential. If you frequently call into TD telephone banking or any bank's telephone banking, register for voice print to avoid the need to answer security questions. And now remember, the banks still might ask you security questions, even if you have registered into a voice print or even if you have a telephone banking pin. If they feel that there is a need to authenticate you further, they might ask you these questions, security questions. Financial scams and frauds come in many different forms, and often they are designed to look like they are coming from your bank. A common type of financial fraud involves fraudsters posing as bank employees to trick victims into disclosing their financial um, or personal information. Make sure you do not, you are not voluntarily disclosing your username or passwords. Nobody, no bank will ask you for your username because they know that they don't need that. No bank will no, need to know your username or your password. Your bank may require you to disclose certain information to confirm your identity and provide you with services. However, there are strict rules governing what the bank can ask you to disclose and how they are allowed to do it. Your bank will never ask you to disclose your PIN, uh, even to a family member. So if you get a call, sometimes they say, somebody's going to call you and just share the PIN with your brother, father, whoever it is. There have been instances where they have been asked to do so and share with somebody who is their family member, whereas the person calling as a family member is also a froster. If you need help finding a banking solution that works for you, visit your local branch where you can speak to a trusted advisor for next steps to suit your unique needs. If you are not comfortable answering questions on the phone and if you feel that um, this pro probably can be a scam, just tell them, I'll go to my bank and talk to an employee there. Third, again, a simple one, um, simple advice is regularly reviewing your bank statements. 
Uh, keep tabs on your statements, online accounts, or banking apps. Regularly checking your bank account transactions is an easy way to identify and potentially uh, identify a potential fraudulent transaction. In the event you don't recognize a transaction, contact your bank immediately to get more information and if needed to start an investigation further as necessary. Some common uh, fraud prevention tools that you can leverage is um, auto deposits, um, TD fraud alerts, two-step verification. So there are multiple ways that you can protect yourself from being a victim of fraud. Um, TD, as well as uh, most of the other financial institutions offer the option of auto deposit when accepting email money transfers. Most common way of um, being involved in a fraud unknowingly is receiving money from somebody from a marketplace, buying things from you and sending you money. You accept the money and it goes into your account, but the money that's, going, uh, that's coming from somebody else is also from a fraud account. With the fraudsters, what they do is, let's say you're selling something for $1,000, they'll send you $3,000 and say, I accidentally transferred you $3,000. I know I need to pay you only $1,000. Can you send me the $2,000 back? Now you are indirectly involved in this scam as well. You didn't knew this, but you are indirectly involved. TD, um, with auto deposit, the money you receive through the Interact e-transfer is automatically deposited into your account and preventing the transfer being deposited somewhere else. So what it means is if you have auto deposit, you don't need to, your, your um, email in case if, it, if it's compromised, uh, your money still will go into your account. If the email is compromised, the fraudsters can leverage that and use the uh, email money transfer to be deposited into a third party account. Auto deposit also gives you a peace of mind knowing that your funds will be automatically deposited so you are less likely to click on unknown links claiming to be e-transfers. If you have current cell phone number on file, you will receive instant text messages notifying you if it detects suspicious activity on your TD credit cards or TD access cards with TD fraud alerts. Now, remember the fraud alerts or the alerts that TD sends you in case if there is a fraudulent activity in your account, TD might send you a text alert. It will never involve a link. Ideally, it will say there was a transaction for $50 at uh, Longo's, for example. Was it you? Yes or no? It will not ask you to do anything else. You only need to answer Y or N. If you're not comfortable answering that, that's okay, absolutely fine. Go to a branch or call the easy line, customer care. They'll have the information and they can take it from there. If you, if you respond to the text saying you didn't complete the transaction, your TD cards will remain blocked and you will need to contact us as we can investigate and file your report. So if you figure out that uh, the message you received um, says that you did a transaction, if it wasn't you, just say no and the card will automatically be blocked, giving you the peace of mind that you do not worry about anything. Keep in mind that TD will never ask you to reply to fraud alert with any information, like I said, or any links. Two-step verification offers an extra layer of protection when logging into your TD online banking accounts. When you log in, we confirm it's you accessing your accounts by requesting a security code um, after you log in. The code is sent to, through a text message, phone call, or by, by generating a code through a tele a TD Authenticate app in case if you have. Uh, TD will never ever send you a text code without you doing anything. So if you're not trying to log in and if you receive a one-time password, that's something somebody's trying to log in and leverage your uh, um, online platform. Uh, you might be asked to provide a one-time password if you go to a branch, for example, and if you're doing certain transaction, that certain transaction that you're doing might require additional factor of authentication, which is, uh, which can be um, one-time password. But that again, will only be happening if you are in the bank doing a transaction, doing a dealing with a like, like a customer care officer in the branch. Um, that's pretty much it from me. Um, I do have some questions that I would like to go. I, I know most of them would have uh, been covered, but let's go ahead. Review some questions.
Yes, I'm back. Thanks, Nick. That was great. Made me think of um, the gift card scam. Uh, we've had that circular, uh, circulating around the university at different times where, um, you know, even for my staff, it's like I'm sending them a message asking them to buy a bunch of gift cards for me. So it makes you, it feels, it makes you feel violated when you're the person that they say, I'm telling everybody who works for me, buy me gift cards, but it's not true. So lots of great yeah. information made me think as well. Some of the things that I've experienced or, um, others have. So we've got a bunch of questions we're going to get to now to answer. One of the first ones I'm going to ask, and I didn't know, really know anything about this, so perhaps you can uh, enlighten us on that. So uh, if let's say someone has their information stolen and they want to request a credit freeze. So what is a credit freeze and do people in Ontario have access to that? Great question. Yes. Thankfully, people know about this, which is good. So um you know, there are two credit bureaus in, um, in, in, in Canada, which is TransUnion and Equifax. So what we are trying to know here probably is with regards to identity theft. In case if you know that there is something um, with regards to identity theft, of course, they can reach out to Equifax and they can reach out to um, TransUnion. Uh, whether they can freeze or not, I'm not sure about that because that's not my purview. I, I don't know whether credit bureaus will freeze the, the request from uh, financial institutions, but they can, if they reach out, if they have um, an, a subscription with them, I don't know how that works, but if they have a subscription, um, they will be able to see how many times, what credit check, which institution had done on them. And uh, certain, um, if somebody suspects that I, I might be a victim of fraud, they can set up an alert on their credit profile. So anytime they go in and, and somebody goes in and tries to do a credit application or something, they, they, they'll get an alert that, let's say, for example, Nick is trying to, I, I set up an a alert. If I go and apply, of course, I'll know. But if somebody else is going and trying to do an application, I'll get an alert. I, of course, would know I didn't go to, let's say, TD and do an application. So I would, I would know something sketchy, right? So um, one of the challenges I think that everybody is facing that, that there's a lot of different ways that people can reach out to you and, and, and try to get you to fall for the scam that is happening, right? So um, do, do we know, like, you know, you talked a little bit about this, like calling someone you know, but are there, do you know if there are any good online tools to test or evaluate communications for potential or presence of fraud? Because it's very easy. You're busy, you're distracted, you get the text, you think, oh, I'll click on it and then at the last minute you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. So um, are there any good online tools to test that? That's a great question. So yes, there are multiple tools, but again, they only gives you education and awareness. Ultimately, the decision is in your hands. You have to be proactive. There are tons of resources. When government has tons of resources that you can leverage and it'll give you education. But like I said, you have to be cognizant, you have to be alert and uh, be careful with dealing with any kind of text calls, emails, because if you link, if, if you click it, there's no way anybody is going to protect you because mm -hmm. ultimately it's you who have the access to your emails, who have the access to your calls, to your text messages. Most of the common frauds that happen this uh, are these three mediums. So maybe it's sort of like going back to that old count to 10, right? Don't rush it to do yeah. something. Start to think and then count to 10 and then think, okay, that's when the, that's when your brain's probably like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. Uh, the yeah. next question that we have from our group today is investment accounts have a trusted person on the know your client from someone other than your spouse or partner. That person can be contacted if there seems to be unusual activity. Do banks have a similar feature for bank checking and savings accounts? Okay. So as of now, we don't have a legal requirement. So the, 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 the reason that TCP, Trusted Contact Person, was introduced for investments, and that's especially for mutual funds only, um, two, three years ago, I believe, is um, that people were being manipulated and uh, people were losing money, for example. People invested at a high point and now the, the value is down. People are being forced, manipulated by family members or somebody to take money out. People are losing money other than the frauds, of course, but this was one of the reasons. So uh, the regulator said, we need to have, the banks need to have something in place that in case if you find something that's not right while dealing with the transaction with the customer, they can assign, and, and just to correct the question, it can be anybody. It can be spouse, it can be brother, friend, it can be anybody. So a trusted contact person is somebody that we can reach out to you, to that person, will not share any, any, any financial information, of course. So um, at times people will ask and say, if I name somebody, 
Will they know my details? Will they know my money? Nope, we don't share anything. We just tell them that the reason we are calling is there's something wrong. We, we suspect um, that is happening with this, with whoever it is um, and see if they can come and help or if they can get involved. As of now, none of the banks have um, a requirement for uh, checking or savings, probably down the line in future. So how do you get, you, you mentioned that a little bit about fraud awareness and stuff. So do you, do you have to sign up for that to get fraud awareness uh, identified from whatever bank provider you're with, whether you're at TD or uh, CIBC or whatnot, to let them know, like, to let you know when there might be fraudulent activity on your, on your card? Or your account. You know, that, that, that's with uh, the credit bureaus, like I said, with credit Equifax okay. and uh, TransUnion. Yeah. Um, is PayPal, is it better to pay, a question to ask about PayPal, is there better to pay using PayPal versus a credit card? Um, the question, is it from the perspective of paying online or is it? Probably playing, paying online, right? Like paying online. Yeah, okay, so just remember, be afraid so... about being your credit card being compromised is it better to use paypal uh, remember credit card is zero liability yes. zero liability right so um, there was a great video by um, i don't remember this name but um and, and it's true today as well try to avoid using your debit card because debit card is your own money versus visa is not your own money you're borrowing it and visa has a liability so mm. it's the same thing if there is something illegit like sketchy that you're dealing with online if it's fraudulent if the fraud happens if you are not intentionally doing it if it was actually a fraud then you'll get the money back of course you'll have to submit a claim um paypal i don't know how they work if there is a fraud what they do what their process is unfortunately i don't know how they work but as long as it's visa like a credit card or mastercard whatever it's concerned um you if you are dealing with a legitimate site of course you are safe it's uh, illegit like sketchy side or something that you are not aware about and unintentionally fall a victim to, you are still covered. So this session is part of, you know, your outreach to help people understand how not to be part of a fraud victim. So I'm going to kind of change this question just a little bit. Like the, ba the every bank must be working on this all the time. How do we prevent frauds and whatnot? So how big of a, of a part of its, of, of TD or any bank's business nowadays is to, to be one step ahead of the fraudsters. Right. So TD, um, what we do is we have our fraud uh, management team, which comes up with, so we don't know, like at branch level, I won't know what kind of frauds are happening. Like I won't be aware about every kind of fraud that are happening, but our team, they know what frauds are out there. What they do is we have LMS courses right from the front line to the back office, everybody deals with this LMS courses. They go through these courses. They know what kind of action should be taken, what are the red flags that they should be looking for in case if they feel the customer is a victim of fraud. And education is on a constant basis. So they have this webinars, LMS courses, which they go through to keep themselves aware of how to protect the customers with these frauds. Now, remember, we, we try to do our part, but at the end of the day, we have instances where the customer says you know what i want to do it it's ultimately their money if they don't disclose anything unfortunately we cannot do it we can't do anything um with this question um from one of our participants is with ai we've experienced fraudulent phone calls with the voice of a parent calling a child how do you combat that like you talked a little bit about that like how do how do you combat that when someone calls so i'll give you an example um we had i had a customer who comes in and um so she wanted a large amount of cash. And she said, I want to talk to a manager. Because we said, oh, no, we cannot give you this much cash. And she comes to my office and she wants to talk to me. She's not agreeing to disclose anything. It's my money. And when we see that the customer is not doing this kind of transaction, there's something wrong. Why do you need this much cash? And she directly says that my uh, grandchild called me and she's in Oakville and she's in an accident. And the, the example that I shared with you that um, she was in a friend's car and there was drugs in it. Now she, they are arresting her as well. The problem is she didn't disclose this with her husband, with the, the grandchild's uh, father, the son, nobody. The problem is you should contact somebody you trust and say, okay, is this right? Or the simplest option, call, call the person who's calling you. 
simple solution would you call the person yes of course would you get the answer yes make sense because if you're calling me and saying nick i'm in trouble i have your number if i call you back you don't pick up or you say no i'm okay yeah. there's a simple solution yeah always call and double check yeah, well, yeah. um Okay, I'm gonna combine these two questions. What can a bank client do to recover money sent by e-transfer that's been intercepted? And what are banks doing to improve the security of e-transfers? Okay, so remember, um, e-transfers are a third-party service, Interact, right? So when somebody sends you money, we only facilitate the deposit part. If your email is compromised, bank cannot do anything. Unfortunately, the bank doesn't have an access to go and do anything with your email. We only facilitate the part where you send the money or receive the money. The only problem that can arise if your email is compromised, if you share your password or something with somebody, that's the only way that somebody will be able to intercept and take the money. Because we haven't come across any instance where the customer says, I didn't disclose anything, but somebody took my information. Because customers does something that has compromised their email, their password, or their app on the phone, Gmail app, or whatever they are using that triggered that uh, money to be intercepted. Um, is there anything like, is, what is considered personal information that you should never reveal? Okay, simple. Whatever impacts uh, your dealings, your demographic details, for example, address, date of birth, phone number, email address, account number, access card, PIN number, any of those information that can impact you financially, is for personal information, your SIN number, for example. The list goes on and on. But whatever basically impacts your financial uh, circumstances or financial dealings is personal information. Right? If somebody's um, asking you, where, where were you tonight? That's a different story. Where did yeah. you go on the weekend? Of course, nobody's going to care about that, right? They, they might in, in a different way, but with finances, they won't be able to impact anything. Um, okay, our next question is, can you comment on inherit inheritance type scams? Uh, this person says, I recently got a long detailed letter from an alleged lawyer in the Virgin Islands about someone whose last name is the same as mine. I did not contact the letter writer. How common are these scams? These are common. People will get faxes. If companies have faxes, com they send faxes to these companies and saying you, are, you have inherited like $59 million dollars. They are, but usually people are people know that nobody is going to send me money. Like there is no inheritance for like ten million dollars or five million dollars. So we come hardly across this kind of frauds. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable. Um, yeah. What about international money transfers? What is the safest way to do that? Um, so usually all the banks have global money transfer, right? Um, there is the other option is wire transfer. As far as the banks are concerned, you you have Visa Direct, where it can go directly to a card, it can go to an account number, or it can go to Western Union, right? And the, the option from the bank is you do a wire transfer. The biggest challenge with international money transfers is you do not deal with regulations that, that, there are, that are applicable to Canada, like Canadian banking systems, right? Now you're dealing with somebody, let's say you, you, you send money to some bank in Portugal, for example. Now whatever happens, money is in a limbo. Where the money is, you don't know. Right. You have to verify the details. For example, even when you send a wire, you verify all the details that you are sending it. We ask the customer, check the details. Once the money is gone, it's gone. Most of the common transfer is wire transfers, which is via bank in branch. So it works with SWIFT, Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Transaction. So it's a third party society like it, it, provider. So we send the money to SWIFT. SWIFT. SWIFT sends the money to the other bank or if there is an intermediary to them. And then it goes to the recipient. Once the money is gone from us to SWIFT, we the tracing is, is tough. Like it takes a long time. So there are multiple ways. As long as you have the right information, you are good. Okay. Um, we just got a couple more questions. Who? Okay, this question is, who has access to my safe deposit box at the bank? My children know where my key is at home. And this is important to the person since... Uh, his will is in the box. So who who does? Like you, I would imagine nobody. you'd have nobody except yourself, nope. right? Except the customer. We cannot open it without your key. You cannot open it without us. Unfortunately, we cannot go in and drill the box. If somebody is deceased, if even if we know, we cannot just do it because they have to go through the whole 
process of a state and stuff. So yeah. if if um, the key, even if the key is lost, and customer sometimes says, "I lost my key. Do you have a, another key, a master key?" Unfortunately, no. No. There is no way we can open the box, or we we request a duplicate key, and and for that the customer has to be present when the person comes in from the uh, the locksmith, and then they drill it in presence of the customer. They check and verify the the, the belongings, and then put up a new lock. Um, okay, I'm gonna, this last question, uh, there's two more questions I'm gonna ask. So the last one, this from what we've got today is, uh, has asked a question around like, are Apple products safe enough or should I use a third party antivirus software? Like, would I don't, I'm not sure you can comment on a specific software pra practice, but I'm probably sure you'd say like, yeah, antivirus software is a pretty good thing to do. Okay, that's a great question. So people ask sometimes, is VPN safe? Yeah. Remember all those things help you secure your 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 um what do you say your whereabouts and stuff right if you compromise your password even on apple there is no way the the, the, the scammers cannot scam you because there is no hundred percent scam proof resource at the end of the day it comes to the individual and it might sound funny because i'm telling the repeating this again and again but it is the truth there have been instances where police are involved. Police say, unfortunately, we can't do anything because the scammers are, I won't say two steps. They are, they are five steps ahead. The only yeah. thing that can save us is safeguarding the information, say, like not sharing with anybody, not clicking any crazy links, not revealing with anybody. That's the only thing you can do. You, of course, of course, that doesn't discount the fact of using um, antivirus and stuff. Of course, you can use that. It um, minimizes the risk of any malware or viruses being getting into the system and compromising your um, banking information. So, of course, you want to leverage that. All right. And then our last question before we wrap up is, you know, tons of great information, lots for things for us to think about and be more aware of. But in a nutshell, is there is there how is the average customer or citizen most vulnerable to fraud these days? Like, is there something that, you know, we're most vulnerable to that makes us fall into these sort of, you know, getting caught in the loop of fraud? Yeah. So the only thing I can say is, one, there is no free money. Two, no bank is going to um, scare you or ask you for any information, no matter what happens. The only thing that can 100% safeguard you is no matter what happens, you do not share with anybody. You do not install anything that you don't know. People install stuff on the phone where you also have your banking information, right? If that is something that is a compromised application, you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do not uh, use public Wi-Fi, for example. There are tons of things. Do not use public Wi-Fi. Do not give out a common scam is people uh, traveling to the States. They have common uh, instances of identity theft where they give their driver's license and their credit card while they are checking into the hotel. So mm -hmm. a simple thing. Do not leave your ID or your credit card out of your sight. So there are multiple things. I, like fraudsters, they have multiple ways they can scam you. Even if you know all the ones that we have right now, they'll come up with something else. So be careful, be cautious. Uh, people use uh, Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, again, coming to the same point, public Wi-Fi for logging into the, 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 the app and stuff. No, nope, you should not. Okay, that's, that's a good tip. I hadn't thought about that, but that's a very good tip. So there's a few good tips I'm going to take away today. Stop using public Wi-Fi. If I, if I do that, I'll, I will try not to do that ever again. Um, number two, it's, you know, call someone, talk to someone, go to the bank, call someone, you know, right? Like as much as the world is so busy, busy, and we do everything online and whatnot, it's, it's just take a moment and call someone, I think is really one of the biggest things I've taken away from you. And also count to 10, like before you hit it, hit the button or answer, maybe just take a, a second or two, just to, just to stop and think and, and to do that. Those are probably my three big takeaways today. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Simple and easy. Simple and easy. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Nick. Sorry. No, Sorry Nick. Yeah, I was no, just no, going to no. say thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your uh, helping us to become more fraud aware during in this month. Um, and for not just this month, but continuing on lots of great tips. 
um, to share with us and for everybody to take away. Um, for our participants today, uh, we uh, have recorded the session, so we will have that available after if you want to watch it again or share it with uh, friends and family to make sure that they're up on the latest uh, fraud awareness tips. And um, as always, uh, we're always appreciative for people joining us on the alumni program, whether in person or virtual. So thank you for taking some time out today on Wednesday afternoon to spend with us as we have our education uh, uh, on uh, fraud awareness. And I'm sure all of us will go away a little smarter. And, and, and you know what? We'll probably just pick up a phone and call someone, Nick, if we have any problems. So if everybody calls you, you, you'll know why. You'll know why. So <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of all of us, Nick, thank you so much. So thanks, everyone, thank for joining us today and have a great Wednesday.